saying, yes, yes, Lord, I will go. I'll be part of the last proclamation of this earth's history. Now, I want to share with you this evening, and I'm going to try to share the screen. So let's put this on. So trust God's prophetic word in the coming impending conflict. The Southern Asia Pacific Division, March 20. Now it's March 20 here, and I guess it's March 21 there. So <laughs> you can choose the date you want. But in any case, what a privilege to be with you and to share with you this uh, precious message. Now in the book of first, or I should say second Peter, the first chapter, verses 19 and 21, we read the following. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now that wonderful passage takes center focus in this presentation that I am making to you today. And what we just read is a beautiful explanation of the reliability of God's word. And what a privilege to be part of God's last day Advent movement that is moving towards the impending conflict and the soon coming of Jesus Christ as explained in his word. And the culmination between the great controversy between Christ and Satan is upon us and thus the impending conflict. Now this message comes from a strong spiritual conviction in my heart and I humbly share it with you today. In fact, our church members are longing to hear you and me preach affirming biblically based Advent movement sermons. When you preach, give the trumpet a certain sound, the sound of heaven and its final messages of Bible truth. Now, the devil is trying to bring in all kinds of aberrations to God's truth changes and we're going to be reviewing that in this message and then we're going to look to christ and his holy word as we proclaim the three angels messages now isaiah 8 20 tells us to the law and to the testimony if they do not speak according to this word it is because there is no light in them so my dear fellow leaders in ssd Accept and follow truth only according to this word, according to God's word. You see, living according to his word is even more meaningful as we experience the strange and deadly COVID-19 pandemic. As we have more recently now experienced the very challenging and sad developments in Eastern Europe that have shown such uh, violence and, and chaos and difficulty, and our hearts go out to our people in that region. You see, people around us now know that something unusual is happening, and they wonder if the end of the world is at hand. Well, actually, I believe we are coming to the close of this earth's history. We've been told in the spirit of prophecy that the final movements will be rapid ones. Now, my fellow leaders and uh, spiritual uh, leaders in SSD, keep your focus on the Bible. <clears throat> Don't allow strange voices to confuse what we believe. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, it tells us, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words 
from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourself. So dear leaders in Southern Asia Pacific Division, stay away from those who are proclaiming strange beliefs and aberrations of biblical truth. We have strong biblical foundational truths given to us by God from the beginning of our Advent movement to be delivered to the world. And as Christ has said in Revelation 3.11, behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. Now, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, told us that we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verse 19 says, we have the prophetic word confirmed. Verse 20 says no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Verse 21, prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, unfortunately, there are people who do not believe what we have just read from the Holy Word. They use the self-centered, historical, critical, or it's sometimes used higher criticism approach, placing their own private interpretation on what the Bible says. Now, Seventh-day Adventists believe in the historical biblical or historical grammatical approach, showing the Bible as absolute truth, allowing it to interpret itself line upon line precept upon precept, verse upon verse. We believe in the historicist approach to prophecy, not the preterist or futurist approaches. You may hear more about that. We believe that what God has given in prophecy has unfolded in history. The historical, biblical, hermeneutical method of Bible study is the only method accepted by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So don't accept the historical critical, accept the historical biblical hermeneutical method. Don't allow any other methods of Bible interpretation to be used in your churches, institutions, or activities, because if you allow anything else, it will be a dynamic mixing of error and truth and will lay the foundation for the acceptance of the mark of the beast and we're going to talk about that towards the end of our message we have a sure word of prophecy that's indicated in the king james version in the new king james it says we have the prophetic word confirmed so the theological pillars of god's seventh day adventist movement are solid and founded on God's holy word. His word is sure and rock solid. We're going to explore some of the faith destroying theological aberrations facing us today, absolutely connected with Babylon, confusion, and from the devil. And then we're going to focus on what our primary mission is lifting up Christ, his word his righteousness, his three angels' messages, and his soon coming. Now, we should expect these aberrations since it's the time of the shaking. In Last Day Events, a compilation of Ellen White's writings, it's a tremendous book. If you don't have it, I urge you to get it uh, in hard copy. Mine is underlined, marked. It's just an amazing book. If you can't get it uh, in hard copy, you can download it, read it. It says on page 173, we are in the shaking time, the time when everything that can be shaken will be shaken. The Lord will not excuse those who know the truth if they do not in word and deed obey his commands. So what are some of these aberrations that so 
grossly misrepresent God and his word. I want to share with you a list of 14. And obviously there are more, but we're going to look at 14 of them. First of all, the word of God is not accepted as authoritative. Now, some people say, oh, don't worry about the words in the scripture. Just get the principles. That's a disastrous delusion. This concept is produced by the father of all lies, Satan himself. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, and verses 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now in Revelation uh, chapter 22, we read, for I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Now, clearly, from this scripture, the words of God are absolutely essential. Seventh-day Adventists, now I want you to understand this, though. I, I don't want you to get a, a confused picture. Seventh-day Adventists believe in thought inspiration, not verbal inspiration. However, God allowed the prophets to use words portraying God's messages. So do not try to change them or speculate using your own private interpretation. My dear fellow leaders in SSD, reject this type of approach, blending current cultural and societal thinking into the word of God, a syncretistic kind of approach. That approach is not the truth of God tested over the centuries. Now, the spirit of prophecy indicates we should read the Bible as it reads. And we're going to read something from a... Uh, a special morning watch, uh, Christ Triumphant, page 226, uh, Ellen White's uh, writings. And this is an amazing quotation. <clears throat> the most learned men in the days of Christ, philosophers, legislators, priests, in all their pride and superiority, could not interpret God's character. The earth was languishing for a teacher sent from God. But when he came, just as the living oracle specified he would come, the priests and instructors of the people could not discern that he was their savior, nor could they understand the manner of his coming. Now, watch this next sentence. This is amazing. Unaccustomed to accept God's word exactly as it reads, or to allow it to be its own interpreter they read it in the light of their maxims or their beliefs and their own thinking and traditions amazing sentence so long had they neglected to study and contemplate the bible that its pages were to them a mystery they turned with aversion from the truth of god to the traditions of men fellow leaders in ssd have complete trust in the Bible according to his word. Number two, attempts to diminish the spirit of prophecy. Now we're doing 14 of these, all right? So we're on number two. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ellen White predicted there would be attempts to destroy God's work through her. In Testimonies to Ministers, page 51, she states the result of such work will be unbelief in the testimonies. And as far as possible, they will make of none effect the work that I have for years been doing. So people do this by ignoring the spirit of prophecy, challenging it, or actually contradicting it. My dear friends in SSD, and I want to thank God because I believe so many of you are such strong believers in the word of God and the spirit of prophecy, and I praise God for that. But Make no apologies for using or promoting the spirit of prophecy and its heavenly counsel. 
It is a heaven sent gift of God to the Seventh day Adventist Church. I firmly believe Ellen White was inspired by God. So the spirit of prophecy is according to his word. Number three, misconceptions of justification and sanctification. Christ's righteousness encompasses his justifying and his sanctifying power. We're going to talk about that for a few moments. And is at the very core of the three angels' messages. It is through Christ's justification that we can be made righteous in the Father's eyes. It is through Christ's sanctification that we can keep the commandments of God. Revelation 12, 17 and Revelation 14, 12 indicate that God's people at the end of time would be keeping the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So Christ's righteousness is beautifully outlined in that wonderful book, Steps to Christ. Now in English, it's pages 62 and 63. Now, if you're looking at a version in a language peculiar to your country, uh, try and find this passage. Can, you can correlate it, pages 62 and 63 in the English. Now, here's a portion from that passage. We have no righteousness of our own with which to meet the claims of the law of God, but Christ has made a way of escape for us. He lived on earth amid trials and temptations such as we have to meet. He lived a sinless life. He died for us. And now he offers to take our sins and give us his righteousness. Praise God for that. What a wonderful explanation of the plan of salvation. But now that is justification. He is given this as a robe of righteousness. Now, the next goes on to say here, more than this, Christ changes the heart. Now, this is sanctification. He abides in your heart by faith. You are to maintain this connection with Christ by faith and the continual surrender of your will to him. And so long as you do this, he will work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. This is sanctification, justification, sanctification, all part of Christ's righteousness. Now, let's go on for a few moments here. Then with Christ working in you, you will manifest the same spirit and do the same good works, works of righteousness, obedience. So we have nothing in ourselves of which to boast. And here is the last part, which is so important. Our only ground of hope is in the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. That's justification, robe of righteousness covering us, Christ's robe of righteousness, and in that wrought by his spirit working in and through us. That's sanctification, his righteous sanctifying power. So, Let's accept the all-encompassing righteousness of Christ according to his word. Number four, denial of the urgency of the time. In this end time, many people don't understand the urgency needed, and they believe they can't do anything about the return of Christ. However, the Lord says we can hasten his coming. <clears throat> Excuse me, 2 Peter 3 Verses 10 through 12 indicate, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? By God's grace and the Holy Spirit's power in total member involvement, we can hasten Christ's coming. Number five, humanism versus heavenly inspiration. Humanism in culture today has nearly eliminated the understanding that supernatural inspiration is overwhelmingly more powerful than any humanistic philosophy. Now, in the Southern Asia Pacific Division, you have many illustrations of religious belief that, that captures and features humanistic philosophy. So you can identify with this. 
but you need to teach people to value the power of God and his holy word in guiding us in all things and to reject humanism completely. In Matthew 15, uh, verses 8 and 9, Jesus quoted from Isaiah 29, verse 13, saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So my dear leaders in SSD, fight against humanism and lift up heavenly inspiration according to God's word. Number six, a disregard for the sanctuary service and the gospel message. There are those who have no regard or even understanding of the beauty of the sanctuary and its services, which point to the gospel, the lamb, Jesus Christ, slain on the cross. We read in Last Day Events, again, if you don't have this book, you need to get it. Uh, page 177, the enemy will bring in false theories, such as the doctrine that there is no sanctuary. This is one of the points on which there will be a departing from the faith. So promote and teach the sanctuary doctrine with Christ, his righteousness, and the everlasting gospel at the very center. Biblical prophecies are real, and Daniel 8, 14, that prophecy is absolutely rock solid. Don't believe anybody who says, oh, no, that was only 2,300 literal days. And it ended with someone called Antiochus Epiphanes. No, 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 my friends in SSD, don't believe that. We use the biblical day-year principle given to interpret prophecy. Allow the Bible to interpret itself. The historicist approach shows us that history has accurately unfolded according to his word. Number seven, ecumenism versus the shaking and sifting of God's church. I strongly urge you to stay away from ecumenism. Instead, focus on the proclamation of the three angels' messages. Believe what the great controversy, the book written by Ellen White, says about the end time setting when the shaking and sifting of the church will take place. Yes, we are to make friends with people, of course. Make friends with people in different churches, that's fine. But we are never to compromise and engage in religious ecumenical activity. The time will come when we will face terrible oppression. So now we must never compromise in the least on our beliefs and doctrines. Last day events tells us soon God's people will be tested by fiery trials, and the great proportion of those who now appear to be genuine and true will prove to be base metal. They won't be gold. They will be just something very inferior. The church may appear as about to fall, but it does not fall. It remains while the sinners in Zion will be sifted out the chaff separated from the precious wheat. This is a terrible ordeal, but nevertheless, it must take place. Stay faithful, my friends in SSD, to our heavenly beliefs according to his word. Number eight, congregationalism versus God's worldwide Seventh-day Adventist remnant church. Now, there are those who wish to focus only on local church and local community settings, ignoring the worldwide family of Seventh-day Adventists in over 200 countries. While the local church and local communities are vitally important, we are a worldwide family of believers who love and support each other. If we focus on others and their needs, including financial, we will be blessed at home beyond measure. Listen to what Testimonies, Volume 6, indicates. The home missionary work will be farther advanced in every way when a more liberal, self-denying, self-sacrificing spirit is manifested for the prosperity of foreign missions. For the prosperity of the home work, the work at home, 
depends largely under God upon the reflex influence of the evangelical work done in countries afar off. You might say, but you know, pastor, we need more money in SSD. Let me tell you something. If you promote wonderful Christian stewardship and help people to understand that by helping others, God will create an enormous blessing on you in your homeland, you will see marvelous success. So think and act globally as well as locally. Stay close to this wonderful world church family and be blessed by God according to his word. And I want to thank SSD for being such a vital part of the worldwide Seventh-day Adventist church. Number nine, attacks against the Godhead. Now, there are those who advocate that the Godhead is not three distinct persons, and this diminishes God. We know from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy that there is absolutely a Godhead made up of three persons united in one. Now, can I explain that? No, but I believe it by faith. The Bible indicates the three persons of the Godhead have existed from eternity to eternity. They were present at creation, at the baptism of Christ, and will be with us forever. Matthew 28, verse 19, tells us to baptize in the name of these three persons, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So my fellow leaders in SSD, the Godhead is three persons according to his word. Number 10, opposition to God's law and his 10 commandments. There are those who are going to say the law has been done away with. However, God's law is eternal. We do not keep God's law, the Ten Commandments, through our own power, but only as we lean on Christ and his righteousness. Again, last day events, page 180, indicates when the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when his law is most despised, then should our zeal be the warmest and our courage and firmness the most unflinching to stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us, to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few, this will be our test. At this time, we must gather warmth from the coldness of others courage from their cowardice and loyalty from their treason. Fellow leaders, give praise to God for his law according to his word. Number 11, evolution versus biblical creation. The devil has attempted to eliminate all references to God's authority as the creator, including the erroneous idea that the earth evolved over billions of years. Both evolution and theistic evolution. Now, theistic evolution is that where some people wanting to try to, to, to merge evolution with the idea of God say, okay, say, okay, God uh, created the earth, oh, I don't know, billions of years ago. He kind of left it there just to do whatever it was going to do. He didn't involve himself in it, and everything just kind of evolved. That's theistic evolution, and it's absolutely incorrect. It doesn't have anything to do with the Bible. Both of these, uh, evolution and theistic evolution, are opposed to the account of creation found in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. The global flood, also denigrated by non-believers, is another indication of God's power and authority to remake the world. Anything revealing God's power and authority is challenged by the devil. However, what God does is always good. He said that in Genesis chapter 1. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. God recently made this earth in six literal days and rested on the seventh day 
which he made holy, reminding us of his creative and redemptive power, which was all done according to his word. Number 12, aberrant lifestyle behavior versus biblical view of sexuality. You see, God created Adam and Eve, the first family, telling them in Genesis 1.28, be fruitful and multiply. But aberrations to God's original plan have come from the devil. So now there are many sexual lifestyles which are opposed to God's original plan and are not part of his purpose for human beings. Romans chapter 1 verses 26 and 27 state, for even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. The rampant sexual aberrations in the world are not condoned by the Bible and will not lead to eternal life. Sexual immorality in any form, it can be heterosexual, homosexual, whatever it is, but those sexual immorality practices, they are to be changed through God's power working in the life. God's ideal is to be followed, again, through his power, to put us in a right relationship with his moral and natural laws. Now, the Bible clearly indicates in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Now, here's a whole long list, okay? Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such, now this is really important, okay? This is really important, this, this sentence, this phrase. And such were some of you. But what happened? You were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. Can you say amen? This is absolutely God's power changing a life. Now, I know this subject is a delicate one, but we cannot be silent on what the Bible teaches us as correct living and practice. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has carefully studied these topics and has issued voted statements by representatives of the World Church, including representatives of the Southern Asia Pacific Division. And uh, they have given the statements that reflect the biblical view on human sexuality, including statements on homosexuality and transgenderism. Now, transgenderism is growing in its influence now. It's a, a very strange kind of development. I encourage you to read these biblically-based official statements by uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, of course, we as Christians are to show respect to all people, but God calls us through his strength to follow his created plan for human sexuality. According to scripture, individuals are created only male or female, and we are to accept only what the Bible says about lifestyle and practice. So adultery, fornication, homosexuality, and aberrant sexual lifestyles are in direct opposition to God's law and heavenly plan for human sexuality. So my dear leaders in SSD, point people to the Bible and God's power to overcome sin according to his word. Number 13, rejection of temperance versus God's comprehensive health ministry and health reform. There are those who advocate unhealthy lifestyles, including the use of alcohol, which is destructive to mind and body. It 
It destroys brain cells. You can never replace those brain cells. Stay away from alcohol. It has even been suggested that substances such as marijuana can enhance spirituality since other religions have used it. I want to tell you, fight against these violations of Christian temperance. Lift up the banner of temperance against any form of mind-altering substance, including all forms of alcohol. The devil will use anything to distract people from God's laws of health and health reform. But God has given us enormous counsel in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy for living a healthy lifestyle. Read and follow it as part of the third angel's message to stay away from anything that will defile you. So my fellow church leaders in SSD, stay faithful to God's pure health principles according to his word. Number 14, disastrous influences of Eastern mysticism. And this is something that in SSD you can identify with very closely. The devil is using Eastern mysticism not only in SSD and Asia areas, but all over the world to bring in all sorts of syncretistic beliefs into the Seventh-day Adventist church, including pantheism and other forms of aberrant theological twisting of the word of God. Second Peter 2 verse 1 indicates, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Hebrews 13 tells us Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace. Friends, let's stay completely away from mystic beliefs and spiritualism and practices which fight against the wonderful belief in the overriding power of God according to his word. So now, my dear leaders in SSD, as we have reviewed these 14 points, let's now <clears throat> look at the real calling for these last days of Earth's history to proclaim worldwide the three angels' messages of Revelation 14 and the corresponding fourth angel of Revelation 18. The Lord is calling us to be part of his amazing last day movement and mission. I get so excited about preaching this precious message, and I know you do too. That's who Seventh-day Adventists are. So revital your, revitalize your work in SSD, in your church, your organization, through revival and reformation, pleading with the Holy Spirit to bring spiritual life to each of us and our church members. Let's earnestly pray for the falling of the latter rain of the Holy Spirit to accomplish this final work. We need revival, reformation, repentance, and humility to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. Now, leading up to the 2022 General Conference session, which has been delayed twice, but now will take place June 6 to 11 in St. Louis, Missouri in the United States. We have been asking people to pray earnestly for the Holy Spirit to fall on his people and prepare us for our work since God formed the Seventh-day Adventist church, his remnant church, to proclaim his three angels' messages of Revelation 14. Sorry, so I should say we have been asking people to pray, and I pray every day for the falling of the latter reign of the Holy Spirit. Now, in Testimonies, Volume 9, page 19, we read the following amazing quotation. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists, that's you and me, <clears throat> excuse me, have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them, to you and to me, has been given, has been entrusted, the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import. And what is it? The proclamation of the first, the second, and the third angel's messages. Get these last two sentences now. There is no other work of so great importance. 
they, Seventh-day Adventists, you and me, are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. Now, let's look at these three messages for a few moments. We read in Revelation 14, 6, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Now, the very core of the three angels' messages is the righteousness of Jesus Christ, his justifying and sanctifying righteousness, which we reviewed. Not our righteousness, but Christ's righteousness. The foundation of the everlasting gospel is based upon Jesus Christ and his great sacrifice for us, for you, and for me. We respond to the gospel message by becoming followers of Christ and do good things because we're connected to Christ. The everlasting gospel is eternal, the past, the present, and the future, focused on Christ. We are called to preach it to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Now, verse 7 goes on to say, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Now, this first angel proclaims with a very loud voice so everyone can hear. Always give God the glory and praise for everything because it says, fear God and give glory to him. Don't give glory to yourself. You know, when someone comes to you and, and, and compliments, oh, you had, you had a marvelous sermon the other day. Oh, you're doing such good work. You know what? Look at that person and just smile at them and say, praise the Lord. Give God the glory. Now, the text says, for the hour of his judgment has come. And yes, we are being judged. Now, beginning in 1844, and it's an accurate date, it is verifiable, it is prophetic, it took place, the investigative judgment in the most holy place in heaven began as the Lord reviewed the lives of people down through history, the end of the 2300 day year uh, section, 1844. One day probation will close. So that's why it's so important to lean on Jesus every day and to proclaim this amazing message of salvation. The passage, passage states, we are to worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea, and the springs of water. And this is crucial because it ties into the third angel's message, signifying that God is the all-powerful creator. We are to worship him not only in spirit and truth, but on the day that he has asked us to worship him, the seventh day Sabbath, the sign of his authority. The Seventh-day Sabbath will be one of the great controversial topics of the last days. It is in complete opposition to the mark of the beast because the seal of God is the keeping of the Seventh-day Sabbath. The time will come to make the ultimate decision of who to worship by indicating where our loyalties lie. With God by worshiping him on his holy seventh day Sabbath, regardless of the consequences, or by following the beast who has set up his false day of worship. It is at that time when that decision has to be made that those who choose to keep Sunday will receive the mark of the beast. For the mark of the beast is the keeping of Sunday, the beast's false day of worship. Great controversy plainly states, with the issue thus clearly brought before him, whoever shall trample upon God's law to obey a human enactment receives the mark of the beast. Now it goes on to say on page 605, the Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty for it is the point of truth especially controverted or argued about and and, and debated 
when the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve him not. While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God, the keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the creator. While one class by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers receive the mark of the beast, the other choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority receive the seal of God. So clearly, dear friends in SSD, the seal of God is connected with keeping the seventh day Sabbath holy as you rely on the Lord, allowing his justifying and sanctifying power to work in you, bringing glory to God. Now, as you know, at the 2020 annual council, if you didn't know, I'm gonna share it with you. We overwhelmingly voted to have the book, The Great Controversy be the missionary book of the year for the two years of 2023 and 2024. The plan is called the Great Controversy Project 2.0. And the goal is to distribute around the world millions upon millions of this very relevant life-changing book in hard copies and electronic downloads. You see, we are inviting all pastors and church members and young people, all Seventh-day Adventists to become personally involved in sharing this book with their friends, neighbors, coworkers, communities, and online. And although some copies may be mailed, the vast majority of the books will be hand delivered as well as downloaded electronically. So please strongly support and participate in this program. Ellen White said the great controversy was the book she wished circulated more than any other book she had written because it has such great truth from the time of the beginning of the early Christian church to the very end of time. And I wanna tell you, my dear uh, leaders in SSD, I believe every word in the great controversy. An incredible description of what will happen in the end of time is found on page 624. Now this is an amazing prediction and it will be absolutely uh, fulfilled. So we need to have our church members understand this. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. He can't be Christ, but he tries to look like Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air. Christ has come. Christ has come. The people prostrate themselves. They, they bow down before uh, him. That's the devil. While he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them. As Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon the earth. His voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. In gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the same gracious, heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. He heals the diseases of the people. And then in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed, get this, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. Can you imagine the deception and the unbelievable delusion? We will not be able to believe what we see or what we hear. We can only believe what we read in the Holy Word of God, the Bible. As you know, when Jesus returns, every eye is going to see him, not just a few, not just some people in Jakarta or in Manila or in, uh, in, in, in some 
a large Bangkok city or, or some city, uh, you know, in, in, in a different pl place around the SSD? No. When Jesus comes, every eye is going to see him. Now, continuing in great controversy, this is, this is an amazing deception, okay? He, the devil, this is on, on page 624, read it for yourself. He, the devil, that is Satan, declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with light and truth. This is the strong, almost overmastering delusion. My friends in SSD, urge our members and the world not to be deceived. Let us keep our eyes on Jesus, his holy word, and that which he is calling us to proclaim. Now, continuing in Revelation, we read in chapter 14, verse 8, and another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So this is the church down through the Middle Ages that continues today, led by the papacy. It will, according to Bible prophecy, unite with apostate Protestantism. That's Protestantism that has gone off the tracks, not truth. And spiritualism to form the triumvirate, the three union connection, attempting to force submission on all who faithfully follow the word of God. So Babylon, it's a symbol of complete confusion, chaos, and the mixing of truth and error. That's what Babylon is. It's fallen because it represents the devil and satanic influences that are confusing the people. Now, the great controversy says, we, we look at it, page 588, through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul, that false lie of the devil, that something lives beyond death, and sacred Sunday, uh, sacred, I'm sorry, Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. Now, you know, my friends, the belief of the immortality of the soul is now nearly universal. But what a comfort to know the truth about death that our loved ones are merely sleeping until Jesus comes. We do not believe in the immortality of the soul, but the devil tries to bring that deception in to cause confusion and open the door to spiritualism. And spiritualism is, is rife. It is all throughout the Southern Asia Pacific division and now throughout the world. And spiritualism will be combined with the Roman power and apostate Protestantism, forming this union to confuse people. It is Babylon. Now, continuing in great controversy, through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and sacred Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former, <clears throat> that's the immortality of the soul, lays the foundation for spiritualism, the latter, Sunday sacredness, creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the Gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power and under the influence of this threefold union, this country, that's talking about the United States, will follow in this step of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. Now, friends, this is not a conditional prophecy. It is absolutely rock solid, confirming Revelation 13 and 14. You can be sure these events will happen. The United States, represented by the two-horned beast of Revelation 13, verse 11, will repudiate or give up the very foundations upon which it was founded. The two horns of this, uh, this beast uh, represent republicanism, not the party, but the form of government termed a republic, and the other horn representing Protestantism. So republicanism and Protestantism. 
This two-horned beast will create an image to the beast through a national Sunday law, which will become universal. SSD will feel it. People all over the world will feel it. The image to the beast is an entity that will pattern its religious understanding after the characteristics of the beast. Now we're told in uh, Great Controversy, page 445, that the image of the beast is apostate Protestantism working unitedly with the government of the United States, enforcing the union of church and state as the beast has done and will do. Revelation 13, 12 states, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And this clearly shows that the image of the beast, the United States uh, combined with apostate Protestantism will initiate activities to support the beast and a national Sunday law. And as the scripture says, will make the whole earth to worship the beast whose deadly wound is healed. So the devil and his supporters and his false day of worship will appear to have triumphed, but it will not last long. God's great sign of his authority as creator, the seventh day Sabbath will be the seal on his people and will triumph forever when Jesus returns to take his people home to heaven. Make no mistake about what the Bible and the spirit of prophecy clearly indicate about last day events and prophecy. Now, Revelation 14, verses 9 and 10, uh, well, through 11, I guess, go on to say, then the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or in his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. So receiving this mark in the, in the forehead represents a conscious acceptance and belief of the beast's instructions. Receiving the mark in the hand represents that even if you may not believe the instructions using your mind, you will sacrifice your eternal life simply to temporarily save your life. As we know, Bible prophecy indicates clearly that the beast is the papacy. This historicist understanding was accepted by many Protestant reformers long before the Seventh-day Adventist Church existed. And, of course, we also accept this teaching based on a careful study of scripture and history. While we are counseled in the book Evangelism by Ellen White not to unnecessarily provoke those in the Roman church, it is important that we as leaders and our members know and understand what we believe and be willing to share it kindly and in a straightforward way. We are not anti-Catholic. We care about the salvation of everyone and will find ways of sharing these all important truths with as many as possible while there is still time. Now, last day events, page 224, we read, the mark of the beast is the papal Sabbath. When the test comes, it will be clearly shown what the mark of the beast is. It is the keeping of Sunday. The sign or seal of God is revealed in the observance of the seventh day Sabbath, the Lord's memorial of creation. The mark of the beast is the opposite of this, the observance of the first day of the week. Now, I believe every word of this explanation from the spirit of prophecy, and I hope you do too. Don't allow anyone to distract you from from what the Bible and spirit of prophecy explain as truth. Ponder this also from last day events. The whole world is to be stirred with enmity or anger 
against Seventh-day Adventists because they will not yield homage to the papacy by honoring Sunday, the institution of this anti-Christian power. I wanna ask you a question. Are, are you ready for that? Am I ready? Now, continuing on page 137, and this is a very stark comparison. All Christendom will be, be divided into two great classes. Those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, and those who worship the beast and his image and receive his mark. So both of these quotations that we've read are very sobering. The three angels' messages end with marvelous verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. By God's grace and power, let's keep all the commandments of God. Let's have complete faith in Jesus. When the powerful injunctions of the third angel are proclaimed, there will be highly unusual responses. On page 307 of Principles for Christian Leaders, we note, and this is writ, these are materials from Ellen White's writings. Heretofore, those who presented the truths of the third angel's message have often been regarded as mere alarmists. Their predictions that religious intolerance would gain control in the United States, that church and state would unite to persecute those who keep the commandments of God have been pronounced groundless and absurd. It has been confidently de declared that this land could never become other than what it has been, the defender of religious freedom. But as the question of enforcing Sunday observances widely agitated, the event so long doubted and disbelieved is seen to be approaching. And the third message will produce an effect which it could not have had before. So my dear brothers and sisters in SSD, as we share God's three angels messages, I encourage you to study deeply and believe the three angels messages personally and allow them to transform your heart. Number two, allow God's spirit to fill you with a deep Christ-like love for everyone as you share these messages. Number three, use biblically based methods to share every aspect of the three angels messages. Of course, we're not supposed to go around beating people over the head with this message, but we're to share these messages with love and hope. The three angels messages not only have strong warning, but great hope through the righteousness of Christ as revealed in the everlasting gospel. As you know, the story of Isaiah in chapter six, telling of his amazement in God's throne room and feeling very inadequate as he saw the power of God. However, the Lord's angel touched Isaiah's lips with a live coal, symbolizing the cleansing of his sin. In Isaiah six, verse eight, God asked, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And Isaiah immediately responded, here am I, send me. In essence, Isaiah said, I will go. As you all know, the Seventh-day Adventist strategic plan for this quinquennium has the theme, reach the world, I will go. God wants each of us to be involved in his last day saving proclamation of the three angels' messages. He invites us to respond to him by saying, yes, Lord, you've given us these three angels' messages and the fourth angel of Revelation 18. Lord, use me. Here I am. I will go and share these messages according to your word throughout the Southern Asia Pacific Division. My dear friends, one day very soon, we're gonna look up in the Eastern sky and we're going to see a small cloud approaching about half the size of a man's hand. We will realize it is the second coming of Jesus Christ. That cloud will get brighter and brighter and larger and larger. All of heaven poured out for this climactic event 
And in the middle of that cloud, that amazing cloud with unnumbered angels, we will see Jesus. And we'll say, this is the God that we have waited for, and he will save us. Jesus will look down and say, well done, good and faithful servants. Enter into the joy of your Lord, and we will ascend to heaven together. I long for that day. I know you do too. You'll see your loved ones who have died in the Lord. But the most important thing is we will see Jesus. And you and I will look around and we'll see those whom we have invited because we said, yes, Lord, I will go and be part of God's last day message to this world. So my dear spiritual leaders in SSD, if you want to commit yourself to Christ and proclaim his last day, three angels messages through Holy Spirit power, as we approach the impending conflict and Christ's soon coming. Would you join me in raising your hand in commitment to the Lord and his word right now? Thank you. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for the commitment shown by these many spiritual leaders of the Southern Asia Pacific Division. Thank you for their dedication. Thank you for their commitment. Thank you for their belief in the word of God. Thank you for their acceptance of the instructions in the spirit of prophecy. Thank you for their willingness to allow the Holy Spirit to work in their lives. Lord, we, we just plead with you to send the latter rain of the Holy Spirit upon your church. Prepare our hearts for this great final act of proclamation of the three angels' messages and the fourth angel throughout the world. Lord, bless your servants, your spiritual leaders in SSD. Give them an unusual sense of your presence in their lives as they have committed themselves to you. We long for the day when Jesus will come. And Lord, until that time, use us because Lord, we have committed to say yes, I will go and be part of this last day proclamation. Thank you for hearing us and bless now the continuance of this international Bible and mission conference for the Southern Asia Pacific Division. In Jesus name we ask it, amen.